Hi again. Hello. I'm the Dr. Dalia. We will start in three minutes. OK. <clears throat> Uh, Hiba, my sound is OK or I have to be closer? No, it's great. OK. We will, we will start now. OK. Uh, good morning, uh, good evening, depend on your location in this world. Um, uh, welcome to our webinar. Um, and my name is Dalia Al Ghamdi. Uh, I'm a pharmacist in background and one of the ISMP uh, fellows. Uh, working as a quality consultant at Ministry of Defense of Saudi Arabia Health Services. And uh, you will be hearing a presentation from uh, Julie Grenal. Uh, she will be speaking to us on medication uh, safety in high risk situations. Um, uh, Julie Grenal uh, is a medication uh, safety consultant um, from Institute of, for Safe Medication Practices. Uh, Ms. Julie is a pharmacist in background with nearly year, uh, 20 years experience in medication safety, uh, combined with 30 years of clinical and management experience. Uh, she retired from her position as a senior director of project and consults uh, in 2022 and continues to support the work for uh, ISMP Canada as a medication safety consultant. Uh, we will move uh, along to our session. Uh, please welcome uh, Julie Grenal uh, to deliver uh, her presentation in this very important uh, topic. Um, uh, kindly uh, notice uh, that the question will be at the end of the session and uh, Post, uh, uh, post it in the question and answer icon, uh, so our speaker will answer uh, them uh, afterward. Julie? 
Thank you very much for that uh, kind invitation, and thank you from the for the Saudi Patient Safety Center and the World Health Organization Collaborating Center on Patient Safety for this invitation today. I'm really delighted to be with you today, and um, it's a particular pleasure for me that this is being coordinated out of Riyadh, which is a place I was fortunate to visit in uh, 2008. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with ISMP Canada, the Institute for Safe Medication Practices Canada, we do shorten it because it's quite long. Uh, we are a national independent not-for-profit organization that purposefully partners with organizations, practitioners, consumers, and caregivers to advance medication safety in all healthcare settings. Uh, while our work is focused in Canada, we also work internationally, including presentations such as this one. Um, ISMP Canada is also part of the International Medication Safety network, which I will discuss uh, more towards the end of this presentation. Um, we're an interdisciplinary team. Our office is in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, but we have people across the country. Um, our CEO is a registered nurse. We have several pharmacists, a physician, a pharmacy technician, and we're supported by other professionals, including um, IT experts and administrative staff. Our work is focused on learning from medication incidents that are shared with us by healthcare professionals and consumers. Um, over the next 40 minutes or so, I'll talk about adverse drug events, including medication errors, as a significant source of patient harm and how the likelihood of harm is increased in high-risk situations. Um, I'll offer some strategies to improve the safety of medication management, particularly in high-risk situations. And at the end, as Dr. Delia mentioned, there'll be a, a question and answer session. Um, just starting with the context, um, adverse events are uh, estimated to be the 14th leading cause of death uh, and of mor morbidity and mortality rather in the world. And most of this harm is preventable. And that's why we're so interested in it because anything that we can change, we want, we want to do that. Um, it's estimated that over half of all medicines are prescribed, dispensed, or sold inappropriately. And, and to address this in 2017, the uh, WHO launched the third uh, Global Patient Safety Challenge, Medications Without Harm. And the goals of this challenge were to reduce severe, avoidable uh, medication-related harm by 50% worldwide over a five-year period. And as a part of this challenge, medication safety was selected as the theme for World Patient Safety Day last year in 2022. And um, you may already know that this year's topic is patient engagement, which is, is really integral to uh, medication safety as well. Um, I want to just uh, start also by just talking about the relationship between medication errors and adverse drug events. So medication errors are really a subset of adverse drug events and adverse drug events uh, can be uh, relate really are related, sorry, adverse drug reactions are related to related to the pharmacologic properties of a medication. Um, so there can be two types, um, type A and, and uh, type B. So type A would be those reactions that are predictable. They're really directly related to the um, intrinsic properties of the medication. So these are things like insulin causing hypoglycemia or opioids causing respiratory depression. Um, the type B reactions are those that are idiosyncratic and therefore not predictable. Although we know they can occur, we can't determine in advance uh, which patients will be affected. And, uh, you know, a very common example would be allergic reactions, also rare side effects. So we know that that certain medications will have rare side effects, but again, we don't know which patients will uh, will be affected. So medication errors or incidents are really uh, mistakes or problems that could cause a mistake with a medication, and and they are um, uh, and therefore they're preventable. And so medication errors can result in adverse drug events. Um, they can also result in just potent the potential for an adverse drug event, or they can be very trivial and cause no problem at all. I also want to start by just defining what exactly is a high risk situation. And essentially, this is any situation that is likely to result in failure, harm, or injury. And so some examples of, uh, of high-risk situations would be things like urgent and emergent care, um, any kind of surgery or operative procedure, um, and uh, overcapacity periods, which is something that we're experiencing a lot in Canada currently. Um, inexperienced staff, including, um, you know, 
uh, experienced staff that have not used a particular protocol or or medication before. Um, and then care of vulnerable patients and um, and use of high alert medications. So when you look at this list, you'll also realize that some of these can be overlapping. And so this leads us to begin to think about what kinds of risks are present in each of these situations and how we can acknowledge and manage them. And, and includes things like how we train our staff, how we implement new protocols or therapies. We also need to recognize that there are certain care areas that are more high risk than others just based on the nature of the work they do and the care they provide. We know that healthcare systems everywhere are strained, um, or our, our teams are often working at or over capacity, and this leads to practitioners who are tired and stressed while caring for very sick patients. Um, COVID uh, in particular over the last few years has added a great deal of strain to healthcare systems around the world. And there's ongoing challenges in many countries related to COVID as well as other endemic diseases. So we need to uh, uh, acknowledge that that we have um, these high risk or high alert populations and and so thinking about the kinds of patients that are are most likely to get into difficulty when things go wrong um, neonates and and pediatrics uh, prenatal and obstetrical patients um, and the elderly these are all vulnerable patient groups that that immediately come to mind um, also patients from marginalized populations who may not have regular access to health care they're also high risk and patients who are not previously known to the healthcare provider or the team, in particular where you don't have an understanding of their medication and our medical and medication history, including allergies, are also potentially at risk. So adding to this mix is, is the use of high alert medications, and, and these are those drugs that, that bear a heightened risk of causing significant har patient harm if they're used in error. And while a mistake might not be more likely with these medications, if a mistake occurs, it's much more likely to cause harm. And, and as you realize, we can have high alert medications, high alert situations, and high alert populations all existing in combination, which just further compounds the, the associated risks. Um, there are a number of medication classes that are very well known as as uh, considered to be high alert. So these would include things like uh, anticoagulants, chemotherapy, medications, concentrated electrolytes, uh, insulin, paralyzing agents, in, and opioids. And just um, as a bit of a caveat, in, in Canada, we tend to use the term high alert medication rather than high risk medication. But for this presentation, really consider these terms to be uh, interchangeable. So some of you will, will be aware that the Institute for Safe Medication Practices in the U.S., who were the originating ISMP organization, um, actually coined the term high alert medication. And they have developed a high alert medication list for um, <clears throat> excuse me, acute care, community and ambulatory care, as well as long-term care. <clears throat> And the uh, um, and all of these uh, lists are available online, and I've included the links uh, on this slide. So I thought it'd be helpful for you to to think about um, how how do we determine whether a medication is added to a high alert medication list, and and so thinking about the examples that I had presented. Um, previously, it's it's clear that the pharmacologic properties of the medications mean that if they're used incorrectly, there's a high potential for harm. For example, anticoagulants can cause severe bleeding if they're given in the wrong dose or, or to the wrong patient. Um, and we know that insulin can cause severe hypoglycemia. And so, as I said earlier, those harmful effects that are related to the intrinsic properties of the medication are called type A reactions. And, and these are more predictable and therefore preventable and the ones that we want to focus on. And, and since the type B reactions are unexpected and we can't predict which patients will experience, experience them, they're a little bit more difficult to prevent, or actually they're in many cases not preventable. But there is crossover for, with things like allergies and, and the particular situation situation that is quite common is a patient who had a previous serious reaction to a medication and this is documented in the health record but then the patient receives the medication again so this is now um, has moved into the preventable side of the equation because because as the healthcare team we should have been aware that this patient should not have received that medication previously 
Um, also need to consider um, some people think that high alert medications are are the narrow therapeutic index drugs, those that that where there's just a small difference between the therapeutic dose and the toxic dose. And this is sometimes the case, but we also have medications in the high alert category where um, where the dosage range can be quite wide and opioids would be an example of that. Um, it's also really important to think about the medication in the context of how it's going to be used in practice and, and you know, are the errors and associated harm related to that? And for example, um, errors where vincristine has been incorrectly administered intrathecally are related to the use of this medication in combination with another one that is given intrathecally. And so, so the preventive strategies are focused on on how to sort of cut off that potential pathway. It ha Christine has to be administered intravenously, and the recommended strategy to avoid intrathecal administration is to only administer it in a premix mini bag, never in a syringe. And so, then you reduce the likelihood that somebody would actually administer that um, through the intrathecal route. So. So one of the things that we think is really key is that everybody should identify high alert medications that are relevant to their own practice setting. And so that is essentially creating your own high alert medication list. And it should be complete enough to encompass medications that are more likely to cause harm, but it can't be every medication that you're using. It you know, can't be overwhelming. And of course, any medication can cause harm given the right set of circumstances, but we want to focus on those ones where that harm is much more likely to result. And no matter where you practice, you probably have a good sense of the core group of medicines that will be on this list. For example, the list that I shared earlier, anticoagulants, chemotherapy, concentrated electrolytes, insulin, paralyzing agents, and opioids. And when you're creating your list, you also want to consider the, the kinds of patients you treat, the kinds of procedures you do, the medications you're actually using. So, so putting a medication on your high alert list that would never be used in your organization is just a uh, becomes a bit of a distraction. Of course, if things changed and you started to use list, but it's really thinking about, you know, what is your context? Where do you see errors happening? Where do you see errors causing harm? And the intent of this list is to help clinicians, patients, and caregivers understand that these medications have additional or particular risks and that there are extra steps that need to be taken to reduce the likelihood of harm with these medications. And in many cases, patients and caregivers can help to reduce the risk of mistakes with these medications if they're informed and engaged in their care. And everyone should understand which medications are on the list and why. So medications need to be on the high alert list for a reason. And there needs to be a specific action associated with putting a medication on a list. So, so what is it you want people to do when, that when they run across that medication? The other thing is that you know, medication use and procedures change over time. So it is important that you have a plan in place to review and update your list periodically. When you're building your organizational list, you want to use what the literature tells you about high alert medications and also use what your own safety data tells you. So this slide is showing information from a five-year review that ISMB Canada did about medications um, reported in medication incidents that caused harm. And you'll see known high alert medications like insulin and opioids, but you'll also see that there are differences between the care sectors. For example, in community pharmacy, Almost 3% of incident reports that caused harm involved levothyroxine, which is not a medication we would, cons we would typically consider to be high alert. So data from your organization suggesting a concern about a medication or a group of medications that you would not typically consider high alert might suggest a need for additional safeguards um, in your practice setting related to these medications. And you'd want to do some further investigation about um, why this medication might be showing up on the list. And you know, incident reporting, even in mandatory systems, is not ever going to give you an exact picture of what's happening. So we always consider the number of incident reports received to be kind of a tip of the iceberg, you know, so so that they are your alert that there could be a problem here. And so if you see something unexpected, it's a an opportunity to do some more investigation. In Canada, we have received a number of requests to develop a specifically Canadian high alert medication list, and this project is currently in progress. 
Um, and so our process began by completing an environmental scan to look at um, uh, high alert medication lists from around the world, um, looking at ISMP Canada's incident reporting databases to see what medication incidents um, uh, had caused harm and which medications were involved. And then we did open and directed consultations um, with uh, Canadian healthcare practitioners to determine what medications they thought should be on a high alert medication list. And this was all used to develop a list of potential medications that could be considered for the Canadian list. And this list has been refined through a Delphi process with an advisory panel and is currently being reviewed by ISMB Canada's internal team. So I don't have an exact timeline for, for you on when that list will be available, but I do anticipate it in the next few months. It's key to remember though, that a list is only a list. Having a list doesn't do anything by itself to make care safer. It's simply the beginning of identifying opportunities to enhance the safeguards for these medications. And the reason you make a high alert risk, a high risk or high alert list is to identify medications that because of their characteristics or because of the way they're used are more likely to cause serious harm in case of an error. And, and therefore these medications need enhanced strategies to improve care and reduce the likelihood of harm. To build those safeguards, you really under need to understand in more detail what kinds of errors are happening with these medications and why. And this is what makes reports and so important. You want to look at your own incident data, um, look at what you've learned from your own analyses, uh, look at, at the literature, look at global patient safety alerts. It really, this is an opportunity to learn from others and, and really seek to understand the fundamental and generally multiple reasons why an error occurs. And it's almost, if almost never, if ever, a single reason that an error has happened. And so the protections that you're developing need to understand, need to address the underlying causes of errors or they're, they're not going to be effective. And many of you will be familiar with James Reason's Swiss cheese model that illustrates how latent and underlying factors can really create a perfect storm that can result in an incident. And this particular adaptation is taken from an article describing why uh, interns make prescribing errors, and it was shared in the WHO Patient Safety Curriculum Guide. So starting on the left, we have the latent failures, organizational factors like workload and handwritten prescriptions, uh, staffing level and culture, and then error producing factors like interruptions, lack of supervision, limited knowledge, repetitious tasks and complex patients. And then, and then finally we get to the active errors, which is the direct interaction between the patient and the provider and the, the uh, inadequate defenses that are going to lead to that situation of inadvertent patient harm down here at the bottom right. So when an error does happen, completing a detailed retrospective analysis can really help the organization and the healthcare team to understand exactly what happened, um, why and how did it happen, and really importantly, what could be done to reduce the likelihood that it could happen again. ISMB Canada was one of the collaborating partners that developed the Canadian uh, Incident Analysis Framework. And, and this is the framework that ISMB Canada uses and also the framework that we teach. Um, the current version was released in 2012 and it is currently under revision. Um, so I do expect there'll be a new one soon, but again, I can't tell you exactly when it'll be available. Um, and just, um, you should also know this is often called root cause analysis. So incident analysis, root cause analysis are also terms that, that can be used interchangeably. Um, in addition to understanding what happened in a particular case and recommending and implementing corrective actions, it's also important to consider what has been learned and how this learning can be shared. And this is particularly important when we look at patient safety globally. Lessons that have been learned in one part of the world should not have to be relearned through patient harm in other parts of the world. We should be able to communicate things and, and particularly communicate those safety strategies so that we can prevent these incidents. 
And the Canadian Instant Analysis Framework proposes seven categories for analysis, um, beginning with the task. What is it that the care providers were working on or attempting to do? And really examining that in detail. And then, and then we move through these categories sort of in order. Um, next, equipment. Were there issues with the equipment they were using? Did they have the right equipment? Um, was there something else going on in the environment? Um, in terms of the patient, were there there are things that, that about the patient that the care team should have considered that might have influenced the situation. Um, and, and then the care team, did, did the care team have the needed knowledge and skills? Were they appropriately supported? And then organization factors, you know, were there appropriate organizational supports? Um, were there policies and procedures? Did people know what they were? Um, were they realistic? Were they followed? And then, uh, and then this other category was just really for anything that that doesn't fit in the other six categories. And if you're familiar with the United States Department of Veterans Affairs Safety Center Root Cause Analysis Guidance, you'll notice that, that these categories are quite similar. When we look at incidents from a systemic perspective, what we're trying to do is take the focus away from, from individual care providers to look at care systems and processes. And this helps us to better see the vulnerabilities in these processes. And this type of analysis really forces us to think about um, why did people make the decisions they did in the moment? We come to this with the perspective that, you know, healthcare providers come to work to do a good job doing their best to look after patients. So, so why did these decisions make sense to them in the moment? And then if they weren't the right decisions, how do we change the system to better support those providers? When you start to do incident analysis, it really forces you to look at process and and process takes you to the question, well, is there an opportunity for us to look at things proactively? Can we identify gaps in processes and systems before things go wrong? And the answer is yes. Certainly, there are a number of things that you will only learn about your organization in a retrospective analysis, but there are many things that you can address by doing a really good proactive risk assessment. And there are several different proactive risk assessment techniques available. And, and lean is one that you might be uh, familiar with. And the lean uh, concept is really looking to remove non-value added steps to make processes more efficient. The one that, that we use in Canada um, at ISMB Canada, uh, there are many processes that, uh, that organizations use in Canada, but ISMB Canada uses and teaches something called failure mode and effects analysis, and we call this FMEA for short. Um, but this is a team-based technique that considers uh, the risks in a process and then looks at the the uh, severity, frequency, and detectability of identified uh, failure opportunities to prioritize, prioritize areas for redesign. But what is common to all proactive risk assessment tools is beginning with process mapping, which is simply identifying all the steps in a process and then considering whether they all make sense. And there is so much value in just process mapping alone identifying the beginning and end of the steps, the beginning and end of a process and all the steps in between. And this is where it can quickly become clear that there are gaps or that the process is unnecessarily complicated. The attendant outcomes of both root cause analysis and failure mode and effects analysis is to strengthen systems. And again, the focus is on how people interact with within processes rather than on how individual providers complete their work. Good system design will anticipate how we as human beings interact with the world around us and acknowledges our strengths and limitations. And following completion of an incident analysis or uh, FMEA project, the team will have to come up with recommended actions and plans for enhanced safeguards. These actions need to be changes that will make a difference to patient care, reducing the risk of an error, increasing the likelihood of detecting and mitigating it, ultimately to increase patient safety. There, there are many opportunities to make healthcare safer. And so to be most effective when you're completing an incident analysis or FMEA, you want to keep the action plan directed to the key problems identified because so, they will always identify many more things than you can solve all at once. And so it is important to just really stay focused. It's also important to understand that different types of interventions are more and less likely to be successful long term. 
And often when an incident occurs or a risk situation is identified, the actions that are taken are primarily based on education or developing new policy. These are what we call person-based actions, meaning that they are relying on individuals to implement them. We know that individual recall is variable. We also know that information overload is common in most healthcare environment. So, so while we need to do these things, given this, we really need stronger strategies to best support our care providers. So then moving up the list, considering simplification and standardization whenever possible to reduce complexity at the bedside and, and using reminders and checklists to reduce the memory burden. And an example uh, of using these strategies is standard order sets for common treatment pathway. And these actually combine simplification, standardization, and checklists. Um, we also recommend independent double checks, particularly for high alert medications. But again, as I said earlier, when we don't want to put all medications on a high alert list, we also really want to consider carefully where do we need those, those independent checks? Where are they going to be most valuable? What are the highest risk points in processes that uh, re those related to medications and otherwise? So, for example, um, before a surgical procedure, generally more than one person will check to with the patient which uh, body part is being operated on. And that's a really important redundancy that that two people are independently checking that they're going to perform surgery on the wrong uh, on the right part of the body. And it is is surprising and shocking how often surgery is is uh, begun in the wrong place. And so that so those independent double checks are really critical, but we need to determine where where are they best used. Same with medications, um, you know, which medications really need that extra final check before we give it to a patient. The most effective strategies on this hierarchy of effectiveness are what we call forcing functions or, or constraints. These are tactics that make it difficult or impossible to complete an action incorrectly. Um, computers can perform repetitive tasks and manage information much more effectively than humans. Having said that, you know, automating poor systems doesn't give us better outcomes. So, so automation is not a panacea either. Um, there is a whole literature on human factors, ergonomics, uh, hazard control, and intervention effectiveness. But the bottom line is always to aim for the highest leverage, most effective strategy you can. And when you're thinking about redesigning systems, you really want to think about how do you design the system to better fit humans? Because what we have historically done is try to fit humans into systems that are not intuitive to them. And that's really the study of human factors and it's so critical to patient safety. I'm, I want to share a different representation of the hierarchy of effectiveness and this one was developed by Kaveh Shojanya and, and Patricia Tribovich who are both Canadian patient safety experts and you'll notice some similarities to the one I just presented but what I really want to highlight in this one is that they have put culture change at the top. And having your whole team focus on safety all the time is the most effective way to achieve this. Their graphic also really nicely highlights that, that in order to get the highest effectiveness in terms of strategies, you also are going to have to put in a higher level of effort. And this is why we often are doing these lower leverage strategies simply because they are things that are reasonably easy to implement. But when you're looking at improvement opportunities, you want to try to consider some strategies from each level. And sometimes you'll have to uh, implement a short-term strategy that might be lower leverage as an interim step while you're working on a longer-term fix. It's also important to think about how you can put interventions in throughout the entire medication use system from for, from purchasing to monitoring and beyond. You can't just rely on a single strategy. The, and the safeguards should overlap and provide multiple opportunities for error prevention, error detection, and error recovery. Every stage of the medication use process that we presented here, so procurement, prescribing, transcribing, preparation, dispensing, administration, monitoring, you'll all realize has multiple sub-processes. And so consequently, there are multiple opportunities and vulnerabilities to consider. If your safety intervention for a particular medication, for example, only focuses on the dispensing stage, you might be missing a lot of the safety picture for that medication. So you, again, you want to think about what we talked about earlier, not just the medication, but also the context in which it's being used. 
One area that we see at ISMB Canada as not receiving enough attention is the opportunity to, to rescue or recover patients from harm um, related to errors. For a number of the high alert, high risk medications, there are rescue agents available, including antidotes and reversal agents. For example, the effects of insulin can be counteracted by glucagon or administration of dextrose, and the effects of opioids can be mitigated by naloxone. And we can anticipate that errors with these medications can occur and then be prepared to treat them when they do. And we need to build these rescue protocols into our intervention plans. Critically, we also need to consider medication error in the differential diagnosis when a patient's condition changes suddenly. And this bulletin was actually published quite a few years ago in 2007. It describes several cases of sudden and unexpected hypoglycemia that resulted in serious patient harm, in one case leading to death. And during ISMB Canada's long association with several Canadian provincial death investigation services, so coroners and medical examiners, we've reviewed a number of fatal cases where patients experienced severe symptoms that could potentially have been reversed if a medication error had been considered by the care team at the time. So when we think about safeguards for high alert medications, we want to be sure that they have a high likelihood of effectiveness and that, and that there are multiple uh, overlapping strategies throughout the medication use process. So you want to consider the overall system, the specific medication, the providers who will use it, and the patients who will receive it. And so safeguards need to be accompanied by awareness programs and supported by change management strategies. And plans for safeguards need to consider the individual and system resources required to implement and maintain them. And importantly, they really need to be sustainable over the long term. So, so while we can be really excited about implementing new um, safeguards, we want to make sure that, that people will actually be able to do these things over the long term, and that has to be part of your strategy. And, and of course, critically, continued use needs to be evaluated and the approach is modified as needed over time. You know, whenever possible, you want to base your plans for safeguard on evidence and experience elsewhere. You want to look for published evidence or advice from, uh, from safety experts to support your plan. So I'm just going to use a couple of case examples to illustrate some of these principles. And uh, both of these cases were published in recent ISMB Canada safety bulletins. And I have included the links on this slide so that uh, you can read the whole bulletin later if you would like to. So the first bulletin I would like to highlight described two cases where pediatric patients died after receiving concentrated potassium chloride injection. And, and this was, I have to say, quite surprising to us at ISMB Canada because we really thought that um, we had implemented safeguards for potassium chloride across the country. It is an accreditation standard. And, um, and so, so these were really important and very tragic cases that we really, really want to make sure that, that everyone can learn from them so we can prevent these kinds of, of tragedies from happening in the future. Um, in the first case, potassium chloride was incorrectly selected and used to flush an IV line. And in the second case, an infant was prescribed a dose of potassium chloride that was not available in a premixed format and had to be prepared by the nurse in the care area. So when we look at assessing for is this a high-risk situation, we have two we have two elements. It meets both the criteria for a high alert medication and a high-risk population. And so when you when you're looking at a planning to use these medications, um, these are our flags that that we do need safeguards in place. And then looking at the um, the analysis that was done on this incident, there were several um, contributing factors that. Uh, that had been identified, the first being just the availability of concentrated potassium care, the concentrated potassium chloride in the patient care area, uh, combined with uh, non standardized processes for prescribing and preparing IV electrolyte solutions, um, a lack of independent double checks, and also confirmation bias related to the similar, similar physical appearance of the electrolyte solutions and, and vials involved. Um, the organization also um, um, asked us to publish a follow-up bulletin on the change management process that they had followed following these, these deaths. And um, 
And one of the things they identified was was that these deaths really identified urgency for change. And and so that that really um, helped the organization in trying to move forward changes. And so they built a multidisciplinary team to guide the change. They developed specific strategies to reinforce the changes they were implementing. And then they they developed communication, developed communication strategies to promote buy in um, and they anchored the change in organizations organizational policies and procedures, and then incorporated continuous monitoring and assessment. And, and these are really important principles whenever you are trying to implement a change in process um, and, uh, um, and, and really are going to be key to long-term success. Um, and as we talked, as I talked about with the hierarchy of effectiveness, that um, the uh, education and policy development by themselves are not likely to, to really generate the long-term change that you need. The other example I wanted to use as an uh, illustration is an example of a proactive risk assessment that was implemented to address anticipated confusion related to a change in product that was needed due to a shortage of the usual concentration of propofol in Canada. And in Canada, this product is usually supplied as a 1% solution, but due to a back order, and I know we have backorders are very common in Canada and I expect they are in other places where you are as well. Um, in this case, a product was being imported from Europe that was a 2% solution, and there were concerns that this could lead to errors and harm. So again, looking at assessing this as a high-risk situation, uh, yes, this is a high-alert medication, um, and, and yes, it's a high-risk population because this will be used in, in operative and other procedures requiring both uh, anesthetic or requiring anesthetic or sedation. So we have both a high-alert medication and a high-risk population. And so in this case, ISMB Canada worked with a number of partners to identify the recommended uh, safety strategies for this product. And uh, the identified strategies began with establishing an interdisciplinary planning team, which then considered the procurement and storage, pharmacy preparation, storage and dispensing, um, the need for alerts and computer systems, including in smart pump libraries, and then whether order sets needed to be updated, and then as well as specific education and communication planning. And, and this approach would be applicable to uh, any other medication related situation and, and also combined from the learning shared uh, with the previous case. Both of these examples really illustrate the importance of considering the whole medication use process when you're planning changes and associated safeguards. And, and this slide offers some examples of strategies that can be considered at the various stages of the medication use process. Um, importantly, you really do have to consider the resources you have available and where the most serious vulnerabilities are. Um, we know that you can't implement everything all at once. Um, but think about what you can do, though, and where you can get the most feasibly, most feasibly effective plan. Um, and again, you'll also want to plan to monitor and evaluate what you've done so that you can track progress and make adjustments as needed. And so just looking at this slide, you'll see, you know, double check show up across um, these three stages, but looking at safe storage, looking at prescribing guidelines, um, you know, ready to use formats for medications, adding of uh, review by clinical pharmacists, you know, looking at single patient doses wherever possible, and then the effective monitoring and, and rescue and recovery, um, as I mentioned, also being critical areas. So I'm just going to ask you to all pause for a minute now and think about a high alert medication that you routinely use in your practice setting. So I'm just going to give you three seconds to do that. So something that, that uh, would hit the high alert uh, list in your practice setting. And now that you have that medication in your mind, I'm going to ask you to think about problems you have seen happen with that medication. And then we're just going to look at this slide and think about it as a checklist. So for the medication you have in your mind, are there some safe design opportunities? Do you have any forcing functions or fail safes in place? Would they be possible with this medication? Um, have you implemented any barriers to prevent this medication being misused? And by misused, we mean used at, you know, in error, not, not deliberately misused, although that could be an issue as well. Um, and are there any limitations to access? So for our potassium chloride example, you know, is potassium chloride concentrate available in patient care areas in your care setting? 
but focusing on your on this particular medication that you have in your mind, can you think of ways you could simplify or standardize the way that you use it? Um, is this something that you have a standard order set for, or is that something that you could implement? Um, do you have reminders and checklists in place, or would they be helpful? Um, do you have any redundancies? Uh, does more than one person do critical checks? Um, are your checking procedures solid? If you're doing those checks, are they good checks? Are, are they likely to detect errors? Are you seeing that they're detecting errors? And what about your team? How are they trained? Is their competency being evaluated? How do they maintain their competence? How do you help them do that? And lastly, is there a plan for error mitigation with this medication? Would your staff recognize the symptom of an error if it occurred? Is there an antidote or reversal agent available? Is it accessible? Do people know how to use it? So you can see that having this kind of checklist is in itself a proactive risk assessment tool that you could use if you were adding a new high alert medication to use in your practice setting or changing the way that you use a medication in your organization. I want to spend the last couple of minutes just talking about the concept of never events. And so never events are defined as patient safety incidents that result in, in serious harm or death and that are, are preventable using organizational checks and balances. And they can occur in any aspect of healthcare, including the use of medications. In 2015, the Canadian Patient Safety Institute released a report that identified five pharmaceutical never events. The first one being wrong root administration of chemotherapy examples, given the example of incidents with bincristine that I talked about earlier. The second is intravenous administration of undiluted or concentrated potassium solutions, example being potassium chloride, again highlighted in one of the cases that I presented. Um, inadvertent injection, injection of epinephrine intended for topical use, and inadvertent overdose of hydromorphone by administering a higher concentration solution than intended, and number five, neuromuscular blockade without sedation, airway control, and ventilation capability. And using learning from this report, um, ISMP Canada worked with the Canadian Patient Safety Institute to develop three medication safety self-assessment programs that were focused on, on never events related to medication use. And these cover more than just the, the five high alert medication categories that, uh, that I uh, mentioned earlier, but they really focus on, on um, the use of high alert medications and high risk situations in hospitals and ambulatory care centers, long-term care and community pharmacies. And these assessments are all available um, and can be downloaded for free from our website using the links that are shown on this slide. So medication safety is a global concern. We all use similar medications. Our patients have similar ailments and our processes have similar vulnerabilities. And so the, the International Medication Safety Network or the IMSN is an international network of established safe medication practice centers operating medication error reporting programs and producing guidance to minimize preventable harms from medication use in practice. The IMSN promotes safer medica medication practice to improve patient safety internationally, and they provide a really important forum to share experience and knowledge, and they have issued advice on specific medication safety issues related to high-risk medications, and the guidance that they are providing is, is adaptable across locations and resource levels. Um, and they've actually published five global uh, targeted medication safety best practices um, focused on number one, removing potassium concentrate injection from drug storage areas on all inpatient nursing units and wards. Um, two, preparing and dispensing vinca alkaloids in a mini bag, never in a syringe. Three, preventing inadvertent daily dosing of oral methotrexate for non-oncologic conditions, which is something that we do continue to see reported in Canada. Um, four, preventing errors related to improper preparation of two-component vaccines, which is, I think, an ongoing problem everywhere. And then uh, lastly, um, a um, recommendation to the global pharmaceutical industry to make premixed oxytocin solutions available everywhere as soon as possible. Um, the next area that they are working on um, is neuromuscular blocker safety. And so these really do align with the uh, five pharmaceutical never events that were identified in Canada. 
So in conclusion, I have just a few final points of advice for organizations and, and clinicians. Um, firstly, start with a list, don't end with a list. So, so that list is really your beginning point. And really think about your environment. What are the medications that you're using? Where are you seeing problems? Um, everywhere you can look for, for opportunities to enhance safeguards and, and looking at implementing multiple overlapping points in the process and ensuring that what you are implementing is meaningful, impactful. And, and, and really reinforcing that measuring effectiveness and monitoring over time. A number five, which really should be number one, is listen to the concerns of your patients and practitioners. They are going to help you to see where the problems are in your systems and, and really um, really promote medication incident reporting and you know, particularly near miss reporting, um, learning from vulnerabilities and creating a culture of safety where everyone is, uh, is invested in making the system safer. And uh, and of course, sharing those good practices so that everyone can learn from them. And and then last but not least, it's so important to celebrate your successes, share your good work. And um, and that is really how we are, are going to move things forward. And and with that, I'll conclude and look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you once again to the the uh, Saudi Patient Safety Center for this opportunity to present to you today. Thank you very much, Julie, for uh, uh, the um, uh, informative topic um, that really uh, having a lot of information for me as a medication safety uh, specialist. Uh, it was really informative and it just bring all the information uh, together that we need it in order to build medication safety in our culture in the, in the complex uh, healthcare system. But I have a comment here regarding uh, the list of high alert medication. So what we usually, because uh, some of the hospital just started or initiated the activity of medication safety and with the accreditation from national and international level, uh, uh, people are putting a huge number of medications in their high alert medication list and in the lookalike sound alike uh, list. So uh, my role as you know, um, uh, uh, medication safety, I'm always telling them try to minimize the number of uh, groups and uh, categories available in your list. And uh, even uh, the, um, uh, the pairs of lookalike sound alike medication in order not to fatigue your staff and at the end of the day, they will see the harm, uh, harmful situation as not harmful situation or safe, safe situation. What do you think about this um, uh, uh, this uh, this thing? You know, happening ha happened in the in the hospitals. Yes, that's it's a really good point that. Um, and, and this is, you know, when we suggest to people when you're developing a high alert medication list, and this is the approach we're taking with the Canadian list, is, is sort of what is the minimum list that that you should be looking at, and and why are medications on the list? So we have to recognize that any medication can cause harm in the right set of circumstances. So what are the ones that that we really want our teams to be aware of, and um, and the uh, and so when we look at uh, um, you know, one of the things that we've been looking at is are all the medications that we've traditionally had on our high alert list, do they all need to stay? And, and, and what are the safeguards we're going to implement? So part of the, part of it is, is not just is the medication on the list, but what is it we want people to do with it? So, um, because we know that that education and awareness by itself is low leverage. So just listing a medication, um, is, you know, if there are only sort of particular circumstance, if if there are particular circumstances where this is a concern, then then what are those circumstances? So, um, so potassium chloride, for example, we think should be on everybody's list, but uh, but only IV, and um, and then what are the safety strategies that should be implemented? Well, we think that concentrated potassium chloride should not be available in care areas, and it should always be provided in a premixed format, and so that. So I don't know if that helps, but it is just if the list is too long, then it's not useful. And mm -hmm. but it is a balance because you don't want to leave something off the list. And that's also why you have to think about the context is, you know, 
um, some medications, some high risk medications are used routinely every day by teams who understand how to use them and know what to watch for. And so they become high risk when they're used in an unusual situation. They or they become more high risk, right? So so we can we can manage risk, and it's it's really about what is the identified risk with the medication. Do we have strategies in place to manage it, and and are there gaps? I agree. Uh, actually, we have uh, a question here. Uh, the more problem uh, we are facing is on concentration medication, uh, like what uh, you talk about uh, on potassium uh, chloride. Um, so, uh, what do you think? Of, you know, I, from my point of view, I, 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 I'm thinking that people need to uh, think more about restriction of the availability of this medication in the clinical areas. And right now, it's one of the standard in the Joint Commission 7th edition that they identify even what's the concentrated electrolyte should be available in, in which area such as mm -hmm. magnesium sulfate, hypertonic solution, and potassium chloride. So, um, what's your point of view here, uh, Julie, uh, regarding potassium chloride spe specifically? Well, potassium chloride, as I said, we think should not be available in patient care areas, and if it is available, should be used, should be in a premixed concentration, and also limiting. Um, uh, the prescribing of unusual concentrations. So, so I think one of the underlying factors to the case that I presented was was customized concentrations being prescribed, and so things that were not not available in a premix format. So, um, if your if your organization is going to allow the prescribing of of um, uh, custom concentrations of potassium, then what are the circumstances and then how are those being prepared? And and I mean, we think really, in, and in Canada, we're fortunate because we have a number of commercially available premix, premix products. I don't know what the availability is over the, you know, globally for that. But even just having order sets that that limit to standard concentrations and ideally prepared by pharmacy if they're not commercially available. But but even if they have to be prepared by nurses, that that they're always in standard concentrations and with explicit instructions so that nurses are not doing calculations at the bedside, right? That it's it's whatever you can do to reduce complexity at the bedside will increase the you know increase safety. Yeah. Um uh Regarding the best practice, Julie, um, uh, you've uh, mentioned five uh, uh, items from the best practice uh, by the ISMP, and I, I think best practice is a good area, starting area for the hospitals uh, in, in order to uh, write a good strategy, write a good plan for uh, uh, future wise in order to um, cover all these uh, best practices. So um, uh, tell us about your experience about uh, having or implementing this uh, uh, best practice by ISMP within uh, Canadian hospitals. Um, well, I, I'm going to flip that a little bit to I think globally um, the International Medication Safety Network has identified five targeted best practices and they've provided quite a lot of supporting documentation so that might be a good place to start if you're looking for where should we start and concentrated electrolytes is is a good place to start. In terms of Canadian experience um, when I joined ISMP Canada back in 2004 I had previously been a director of pharmacy in a small hospital and and we had um, initially kind of struggled with this idea of of con you know standardized prescribing for concentrated potassium uh, and and that was something that we did implement but it was very well supported by ISMP Canada getting manufacturers on board so getting that the we need those industry partners to step up and and um, and prepare medications in a format that is ready to use and I know that that you know the ability to do that globally is probably not as variable um but but there you know there there has been i would say in canada transition from 
you know, physicians wanting to be able to individualize care for every patient to um, to recognizing that we actually can standardize quite a lot. And so in Canada, we use a lot of of care pathways, standard order sets. And and I think um, while these are not perfect, they they do su the supporting standardized prescribing, you know, allowing um, prescribers, physicians, and and we have a lot of nurse practitioners and now physician assistants in Canada as well. Um, but giving them a template that they can they can you know choose the things that are appropriate for a particular patient, have the flexibility to make changes where they need to. But but sort of there are areas where the flexibility is limited. So in Canada, we have potassium in, in uh, 20 and 40 uh, milliequivalent or millimole per liter. And, mm -hmm. and for most patients, and then there are mini bags for, um, for the, uh, for different doses. And I haven't worked frontline for a while, so I wouldn't want to exactly say what those are, but, um, but the, uh, I think it's, it's getting prescribers on board. And that's why also starting with these interdisciplinary teams, whenever you're planning a change, you know, getting, you got to get all the right people at the table. And the same when you're doing any kind of incident analysis, proactive risk assessment, you you really want to have, um, you want that interdisciplinary team because that's how you really get buy-in and and you can, you know, move change forward. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here, uh, Julie, uh, from uh, Fatima. Uh, she mentioned that uh, in an uh, institution, um, uh, where there is no uh, inpatient pharmacy and there is no uh, clinical pharmacist available. What is the best way uh, to go about uh, preparing such uh, a list and to tackle uh, errors related to high risk medications? Well, if I mean, it's it's I mean a ph pharmacist I, we as a pharmacist we think that there there are really important opportunities and and um, advice pharmacists can provide but if you don't have pharmacists then you do need to rely on your nurses and your medical team to to kind of talk look at those risks so I think it does go back to um, first of all looking at what are the medications on the high alert medication list that have been published globally. Um, what medications are you using in your organization? Um, looking at uh, that checklist I provided around, um, you know, what are some of the safeguards you could consider? Um, is there lit like is there literature on errors with the with the medications you're using? Um, are you um, in your own experience, have you seen problems with particular medications? And then wherever possible, you want to simplify and standardize so that, as I said, that every doctor isn't ordering a different concentration of potassium chloride. So if you don't have a commercially available product, the nurses all know that if we're going to give potassium chloride IV, this is how this is what we do. This is how we do it. And there has to be an independent double check. You want to segregate access to your potassium chloride concentrate so that it's not just in a place where anybody can just go and grab it. Um, I mean, there are problems with that, too. Like there one of the cases I uh, uh, there was a coroner's inquest when I first joined ICB Canada where where a hospital had locked up the potassium chloride, but it was in such a far corner of the of the nursing unit that the nurses would get down there and not remember what how much they needed. So then they would take more than they needed and then they'd wind up with a vial in their pocket that they man they intend to re to return later. So it's it's not it's not simple, but the the Proactive risk assessment and process mapping are really core strategies too. Like always look at what is it you're trying to accomplish, what are the steps, and where are the potential gaps, and you can proactively find a lot of problems that way. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, actually, um, uh, with um, uh, having a list uh, for of high alert medication or uh, also uh, look alike, sound alike, we need to focus that. Uh, it's not um, a solo work by the pharmacy staff or the pharmacist. Yes, that's or right. The patient safety officer. It needs to be uh, done in multidisciplinary uh, yes. team. So we need to have the medical staff with us in the same table with the nursing uh, staff and uh, even the quality staff need uh, to sit with us in order to look at our reporting system. How, what type of medication or categories that having a high uh, number or percentage 
uh, during the, the year that we need to update our list. Um, following the standards um, and uh, be open in the discussion and uh, try to understand each other background because what's important for me as a pharmacist is different than physician, different than uh, nurse, uh, nursing staff. Um, uh, so unfortunately, uh, we, are, we are seeing it in some immature uh, maybe hospitals uh, that they are not uh, sharing the ideas uh, together. Yeah, and I, I think in Canada, there's been an evolution in that over time as well, you know, but it absolutely the the more we can work together as teams and understand, you know, like understand the the barriers and limitations and and also facilitators to how do we move things forward. But I would say the most important thing is focus on where is the biggest harm, like your, you know, where is the biggest potential for harm? And so looking at cases where you know patients have been harmed is a very good place to start because those are the most critical cases that that you can um, start to, uh, you know, make those processes safer going forward. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Jolie, for uh, all this uh, important information that you share it with us uh, and uh, uh, with um, in this day, and um, uh, you have any further uh, comment or uh, in order to close this uh, uh, event? No, I don't think so. I'm. It was a great pleasure to speak with you today, and thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, wish you all a wonderful evening or a rest of the day wherever you are. Yeah, thank you, thank you, everyone.